This is session seven, the consonants of English, the second part. I'm Mohsen Reza Zadeh. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Isfahan. In the previous session, we talked about stop consonants. We focused on aspiration, which is a period of voicelessness after the release of the stop. It's the burst of her at the start of words like pie, tie, or for example, chi. Uh, we also focused on the effect of s plus voiceless stop, as in words such as spy, sty, sky. Um, number three is about uh, the length of vowels. If you remember, we said that um, vowel is much shorter before the voiceless consonants than it is before the voiced consonants. And this was the major uh, difference. Number four uh, is uh, unreleased stops. For example, uh, sometimes we pronounce a word like uh, tap. And sometimes uh, we say tap. In fact, the final consonant here it can be released or unreleased. For example, when you say take a cap and when we say take a cap now or when we say the cat versus the cat pushed. We see that in uh, one of them the uh, final consonant is unreleased. Number five, stop consonants a glottal stop. If you remember, we said that we have um, this glottal stop in words like, for example, um, ah, ah, or for example, in uh, words like kitten, fatten, or bitten. These are examples of glottal stop. Today, we are going to um, talk about other characteristics of stop consonants, and later we will talk about fricatives and affricates. Stop consonants, nasal plosion. When a voiced stop and its homoorganic nasal occur in the same word, as in hidden, the stop is released through the nose by lowering of the soft palate or the vellum. If you pay attention in a word like hidden, we have a voiced stop, which is de, and its homoorganic nasal, which is ne. Both of them are um, alveolar. De and ne. If you pay attention, both the place of articulation for both of them is alveolar. So um, we say that they are homoorganic. When we have this situation, the stop here, de, is released through the nose, not through the mouth. When we say de, the release is through the mouth. But when uh, we have a word like hidden, hidden, I just release uh, this stop through my nose, not through my mouth. Hidden, not hidden. Hidden. This uh, is called nasal plosion. Uh, some examples are sadden. Sadden. If you say sadden, that is, um, you add a vowel. E between D and N, it is considered uh, a mark of a foreign accent. And the other example is sudden, sudden, or leaden, 
Letten. What about a uh, kitten? Do you see any nasal plosion here? This figure illustrates nasal plosion. As I said, when a voiced stop and a nasal occur in the same word as in hidden, the stop is not released in the usual way. Both the D and the N are alveolar consonants. The tongue comes up and contacts the alveolar ridge for D and states, uh, stays there uh, for the nasal, which becomes syllabic. Consequently, um, as shown in this figure, the air pressure built up behind the stop closure is um, released through the nose by the lowering of the soft palate or vellum. So if you look at this picture, you can see the vellum. When the vellum is raised, we have to release it through the mouth. But when the vellum is not raised, uh, you have to release the stop through the nose because the mouth is closed and the vellum is not raised. So the only way uh, for the air to come out is through your nose. Uh, listen again. Hidden. Hidden. Right now, my mouth is closed and the vellum is lowered so i release the stop which is there through my nose this is called nasal plosion this phenomena uh, is known as a nasal plosion if you remember in the other slide i raised a question what about a word like kitten? Do we have nasal plosion in the pronunciation of kitten? The answer is yes. In fact, nasal plosion also occurs in the words with T followed by N. So, uh, for those people who don't have a glottal stop instead of T, uh, we have this pronunciation, kitten kitten here i have a nasal plosion that is i release t through my nose kitten but um, the reality is that majority of english speakers pronounce this word with a glottal stop that is they don't have nasal plosion they have glottal stop do you remember glottal stop for example in Ah, we have a glottal stop. So if we want to use glottal stop in the pronunciation of this word, we should say kitten, kitten. This is um, the usage of glottal stop for kitten. Or nasal plosion is kitten. In fact, nasal plosion occurs only if there is no glottal stop. It is not possible to have a glottal stop and have nasal plosion because glottal stop requires your mouth to be open, but nasal plosion vice versa. Another condition is that only if the stop is followed by a homoorganic nasal, we can have a nasal plosion. Like in this example for kitten, T and ne, both of them are homoorganic. This is why we can have a nasal plosion. So remember these two conditions for nasal plosion. First, we can have it when there is no glottal stop, and second, uh, this stop should be followed by a homoorganic nasal. What does homoorganic mean? When two sounds have the same place of articulation, they are said to be homoorganic. Thus, the consonants de and ne, which are both articulated on the alveolar ridge, are homoorganic. 
for nasal plosion to occur within a word, there must be a stop followed by a homorganic nasal. Only in these circumstances can there be pressure first built up in the mouth during the stop and then released through the nose by lowering the soft palate. Uh, other examples like sudden or leaden. If you pay attention, you see that we have de and ne. Both of them are um, on the alveolar leach, so they are homoorganic. And if you remember, we said that one condition for nasal plosion to happen is that the stop should be followed by a um, by a, a homoorganic nasal. Uh, what about this? How do you read uh, these two words? Do you think that we can have a nasal plosion for the pronunciation of middle and uh, little? Try to pronounce it for yourself and think about the articulation. Do you think that we can have a nasal plosion for these two words? Or can we have glottal stop or is it something else? Think about it. Before answering the question mentioned in the previous slide, let me pronounce the words again. The first one was middle, middle, and the other one was little, little. In fact, when an alveolar stop like T or D occurs before a homoorganic lateral like L, as in little or ladle or middle, we can have a kind of plosion. In fact, the air pressure built up during the stop is released by lowering the sides of the tongue. Here we call it lateral plosion. It is like nasal plosion, but the difference is that in nasal plosion, the, release, uh, the air is released through your nose, but here the air is released by lowering the sides, two sides of your tongue, and the air comes out of your mouth. This is why we call it lateral position, because we use the sides of the tongue. As I said, another example is middle. So uh, this phenomenon, which is similar to na nasal plosion, may take place when an alveolar stop occurs before a homoorganic lateral. Uh, say the word middle and note the action of the tongue middle, middle. Many people, particularly Spanish speakers, maintain the tongue contact on the alveolar ridge through both the stop and the lateral. That is, they keep the tongue on the alveolar ridge when they say middle, middle. And um, they release it only at the end of the word. Others, in fact, uh, I'm talking about Americans, pronounce very short vowel in the second syllable. That is, they say middle, middle. British people say mill, mill. For those who have lateral plosion, no vowel sound occurs in the second syllable of little or ladle. The final consonants in all these words are syllabic. So remember that we have two types of plosions. One of them was nasal plosion and the one we introduced here is a lateral plosion. Look at this question. How the consonant between these vowels, that is te, between these vowels in these three words 
is pronounced. What do you think about it? Try to pronounce these three words for yourself. Now, think about the way you pronounce T in these three words. In fact, it is a quick tap in which the tongue tip is thrown against the alveolar ridge. And according to IPA, the symbol is this, something like R in English. So we can transcribe city as this, city. So the pronunciation for these uh, words with uh, tongue tap would be city, better, or writer. In fact, uh, many speakers, including most Americans, uh, pronounce uh, these three words with a tap. And uh, many Americans also make this kind of tap when the occurs after a stressed vowel and before an unstressed vowel. Um, like uh, in ladder. As a result, um, they do not distinguish between some pairs of words such as uh, ladder and ladder, writer and writer. Right now, you cannot distinguish the difference because I just uh, chose the American pronunciation. Uh, but some uh, maintain a distinction by having a shorter vowel in words such as a uh, letter that have a voiceless consonant in their underlying form. So can you distinguish the difference between these uh, pairs of words? Try to pronounce them for yourself once. Yes? Did you pronounce them for yourself? Okay, um, the point is that some dialects of North Korean American English, particularly from Central Canada, also distinguish between words, uh, word pairs like writer and writer. But here, the point that I want you to focus on is that there is a difference between these pairs and that is the length of vowel. In fact, shorter vowel length um, is uh, something which you can find in these two words, later and writer. Here, the vowels are shorter. Therefore, if I want to pronounce it, it would be uh, ladder for the first word. And now for latter, it would be uh, ladder, ladder and ladder, or rider and rider, rider and rider, ladder and ladder. If you pay attention, you can see that vowel length is much shorter um, in the second one, ladder and ladder. In the second one, it is shorter. As I said, some dialects of North American English, uh, particularly Central Canada, they also distinguish between word pairs like writer and writer, uh, which are both said with a tap. Um, in fact, they have this additional vowel quality difference that is redundant with the vowel length difference found in other dialects. So instead of this uh, vowel length, um, Canadians um, also pronounce it uh, like this, writer and raider. So we can summarize the discussion of stop consonants by thinking of the possibilities there are in form of a branching diagram as shown in this slide. The first question to consider is whether the gesture for the stop is released or not, released or unreleased. 
If it is released, then we should consider if it is oral or nasal. So if it is oral, then we should see if it is central or lateral. Is the release due to the lowering of the vellum or not? If the vellum is lowered with air pressuring, um, air in fact escaping through the nose, then uh, it is nasal plosion. But if the uh, closure in the mouth um, is entirely removed, or if the articulation in the midline retained and one or both sides of the tongue lowered, um, we have lateral plosion. If it is true, the mouth, then it is central and it is normal. In fact, you should be able to produce words illustrating all these possibilities. Uh, for coronal stops, there are uh, there is an additional point uh, not shown in this figure. Um, in fact, it is T or D sound produced as tap. Um, we couldn't show it in this diagram, but uh, I explained it in the previous slide. Fricatives. Fricatives like F, V, Th, Th, S, Z. Sh and j are like stops p, b, t, d, k, and g in four ways. In fact, the major allophonic variations that do occur are in many ways similar to those of the stops. So um, here are the four similarities between fricatives and stops. Uh, number one, vowels before voiceless stops or fricatives are shorter than before voiced stops or fricatives. If you remember before, we said that in prayers like mat and mad, uh, the vowel before voiceless stop is shorter than before the voiced stop. That is vowel in mat a in mat is shorter than a in mat. The same also applies for um, fricatives. If you pay attention to strife and strive, uh, the vowel before voiceless fricative here fe, as in strife, is shorter than before the voiced fricative, which is ve. So, uh, in this pair, strife and strive, um, the fact is that a, strife, a before fe is shorter than a before v in strive. Uh, or, for example, teeth and teeth, or rice and rise, or uh, mission and uh, vision. And this is the first similarity, length of vowel. And the second similarity, final voiceless stops and also final voiceless fricatives are longer than final voiced stops and final voiced fricatives. If you remember before we said that in a pearl like hit and hid, the final voiceless one, that is in hit, t, is longer than the final voiced one in hit. Sometimes we pronounce it like this, hit, this t is longer than hit, d, that is the voiceless one is longer than the voiced one. Uh, this is also true for uh, final voiceless fricatives. An example is given here, lace and lace. Here, lace, we have final voiceless stop, lace, se, lace. 
This C sound is longer than the final voiced fricative like Z in lace. Lace, lace. If you pay attention, you can uh, feel that. When I say lace, C is longer. Listen again. Lace, lace. So this is the second um, exam, the second uh, similarity. Another example can be a pearl like this: safe and save, safe, save. If you pay attention, when I say safe, this f is longer than v in save, safe, save. Try to practice pairs like this a couple of times and uh, try to figure out the length of voiceless fricatives and voiced fricatives. Number three, fricatives are also like stops in another way. Final stops and also final fricatives classified as voiced are not actually voiced during the articulation unless the adjacent sounds are voiced. Look at the examples. Prove two times two is four or try to improve versus prove it. In general, voiced fricatives at the end of a word, as in prove, or for example, choose, are voiced throughout their articulation, only when they are followed by another voiced sound. Look at these examples. When we, uh, when we read this sentence, prove two times two is four. Now compare it with this, prove it. Okay, as I said, uh, the final fricatives, the final voiced fricatives are voiced only when they are followed by another voiced sound. When I say prove it, next sound is E, which is a vowel, as you, and as you know, it is voiced. So you can see that when I say prove it, V is voiced, is fully voiced, prove it prove it but when i say prove two times two is four prove two or when i say try to improve at the end of the sentence where v is followed by a voiceless sound t in the first sentence or by a pause at the end of the second sentence try to prove in these two instances, uh, V is not fully voiced, but in the other example, prove it, V is fully voiced. It is because of the um, voicing of the adjacent sound, which is E in prove it. And number four, both types of articulations involve an obstruction of the airstream both in final uh, uh, for stops we have obstruction of the air and for fricatives we have obstruction of the air this is um, the uh, final similarity between fricatives and stops Since fricatives and stops have an articulatory feature in common, that is obstruction of the air, both of them have obstruction of the air, and since they act together in phonological pattern, we refer to both of them as obstruents. Stops and fricatives are the only English consonants that can be either voiced or voiceless. We have, for example, uh, te and de. We have se and ze. Se is voiceless, ze is voice. Te is voiceless, de 
is voiced. Uh, so stops and fricatives are the only English consonants that can be both. They can be either voiced or uh, voiceless. Up to now, we talked about the similarities between uh, fricatives and stops. But what about the differences? In fact, fricatives do differ from stops in that they sometimes involve lip rounding or labialization. Pronounce these words fin, fin, sin, zil, shin, leisure. As you can see, the primary articulation in these fricatives is the close approximation of two articulators so that the friction can be heard. When I say th, th, I have uh, this close approximation of two articulators. What are the two articulation, articulators when I pronounce th, th, as in thin? Thin. The two articulators are uh, the tongue and teeth. Yes. So I have this close approximation so that uh, you can hear the friction. Or when I say f, fin, fin. And this is called primary articulation. Now, the lip rounding is a lesser articulation in that the two lips approach one another but not sufficiently to cause friction. A lesser degree of closure not involved in the primary articulation is called secondary articulation. That is, uh, for sounds like sh or j, we say that these two are strongly labialized. Why? Because when I pronounce sh or j, uh, you can see that the degree of lip rounding is too much. So I say it is strongly labialized, sh and zh. But when I want to pronounce s and z, the degree of labialization is not that much. But um, the appearance of the lips change. So I say that s and z are slightly labialized. But the primary articulation is something else. The primary articulation is uh, the one that causes the friction. When I say, for example, um, th is dental. That is the primary articulation. But the uh, secondary articulation is labialization. Or for example, for sh, the secondary articulation, which is the lesser articulation, is labialization. So as you see, we can have primary articulation and the secondary articulation. Um, for the fricatives, uh, we for fricatives like s and z, we have a uh, slight labialization. For sh and z, we have um, strong labialization. Affricates. What are affricates? A sequence of a stop followed by a fricative that functions as if it were a single sound, like CH and J. So stop plus fricative forms an affricate. We had it before, it's clear. But try to answer this question now. Are T plus F as in eighth, and t plus c, as in cats. So, eighth and cats. Tss. Different from ch 
as in church and j as in judge what do you think in both of them we have the sequence of two words two sounds we have th ts and we have ch and j but um, are they different the answer is yes the first two stop fricative sequence is a consonant cluster that is a sequence of consonants two consonants t and th or t and c as in cats so this is called a consonant cluster but uh, ch and j are the only stop fricative sequences in english that can occur at both the beginning and the end of words you can uh, you cannot find uh, ts or th at the beginning of words because they are just consonant clusters but you can find ch and j both at the beginning and or in the middle of words in fact um, one way to convince yourself that uh, the affricates uh, like ch and j are phonetic sequences of stop followed by fricative is to record yourself saying words like itch and batch and then play them backwards using a uh, wave surfer and uh, try to use reverse function to do this to do this when you use reverse function uh, for for example itch the first thing that you hear in the reverse form is sh this uh, i think can convince you that um affricate is a mixture of a stop plus a fricative so today we continued our discussion on stop consonants from the previous session uh, we had a discussion on the nasal plosion and lateral plosion and tongue tap uh, for stop consonants in the previous session uh, we talked about aspiration uh, s plus voiceless stop vowel length unreleased stops and glottal stops so um, everything about stop consonants is uh, finished and we had a diagram uh, in fact a branching diagram uh, showing a summary of the discussion of stop consonants um, we also had a discussion on the fricatives we talked about the similarities and differences between fricatives and stops and at the end um, we talked about affricates uh, this is the end of uh, session seven uh, goodbye everybody